Whiskey time? Whiskey, right. whiskey, whiskey time. time. Whiskey time. Well, um, hopefully everyone can hear us at home. We'll get confirmation of that shortly. In the meantime, uh, I'd like to quote Mr. Jagger and say, let me introduce myself. And my name is Mark, and I have a small social media presence online under the pseudonym Whiskey is My Jam. But I'm really here tonight, uh, this afternoon, because I've hosted a couple of whiskey tastings here in Tasmania with Remnant Whiskey Co. over the past few months and had the privilege of uh, trying their first two releases. First time last year was The Scoundrel and then earlier this year was The Fly By Night. So when one of the directors asked me, would I mind sitting upstairs, Jack Green, on a Saturday afternoon and ask these two gentlemen to my right, Peter and Nathan, a few questions about the Remnant Whiskey Co and their upcoming release. I didn't hesitate. So first of all, we'll be talking to Peter. Now, Peter is uh, particularly suited in explaining the Remnant story, given his Tasmanian whiskey experience. And he'll go into the details to why we have a company with a bit of double entendre about the name. So I'll hand over to Peter and we'll go from there. Yeah, well, um so the, the the name remnant the, the second part of the name nant that name nant was um i got a little bit upset about the the whole nant um whiskey business because my great grandparents and my grandparents owned a, a property at bothwell called nant and um they were there for a, a couple of generations almost into three generations and uh, then it got sold out of the family um, when I was when I was a kid, I used to go and play in this old flour mill there on the place. And um, eventually, after another couple of owners, uh, it was bought by a Sydney, I um, mean a Brisbane investor, who turned it into a whisky distillery. I got a job there restoring this old flour mill that I used to play in when I was a kid. Um, it was a water-driven flour mill, and it was pretty well wrecked. And um, so I repaired the old water wheel and uh, a lot of these wooden cogs inside the mill and that the millstones were all in bits and I put all them back together and got the whole thing working again to, um, to grist the grain to make the Nant whiskey. Anyway, fast forward a few years and um, as part of my payment for doing that job, I bought a barrel, an investment barrel, it's just part of my wages. And then there's probably a lot of you would know the whole thing went belly up in what I would describe as a big Ponzi scheme. But anyway, a lot of investors bought barrels they were promised nine and a half percent compounding interest on their investment. Um, that original owner went bankrupt. Is can't really under um, big police investigation. Don't know what's going to happen with that. But um, anyway, the uh, new owners took over. Um, that didn't go so well either there for a while. And um, I offered to buy buy out a lot of the barrel investors who actually did have whiskey in their barrels. There's a lot of a lot of barrels didn't have any whiskey in them. So um, I grabbed my eldest son and a few other investors, business investors, and, and we purchased almost 300 barrels from those investors who a lot of them were just totally left high and dry with no money. They had whiskey in barrels they couldn't do anything with because of the Australian laws and the excise laws, they just couldn't get access to it. And uh, we, we, see, we bailed them out. A lot of the, a lot of the, barrel, the better barrels had been, had the ice picked out of them, um, but yeah, we, we still did find some lovely barrels amongst them, not a lot. Um, but what we've found we can do with the, with the help of Nathan here, we've blended the barrels together and end up with a lovely, very, very easy, smooth drinking whiskey. Um, just for example, you know, some of the barrels have just gone too woody. This is just a nice, easy one to describe. And yet there are other younger barrels that just did not have enough wood notes. So you blend those two together in the right proportion and you end up back in balance. But but um, by mucking about with other flavours and things too, you can end up with a very, very balanced whisky from a lot of fairly ordinary barrels. But this whole whole barrel investment scheme, you know, the, the amount that was offered, the, the payback just would just was totally, utterly un, unsustainable. And um, so that's why the whole thing went belly up. But we managed to rescue, the um, reason we rescued the, the investors, they didn't get back. Most of them didn't get back what they were expecting, but unfortunately we, those terms, original terms were just totally unsustainable. But um, just with the uh, great help from, from Nathan, who's got a fantastic uh, palette, yeah, we've um, blend, blended different barrels together. And, and um, this afternoon, we've got a, 
Uh, I think there was about six barrels um, um, in, in each of these two blends, Black Spot, Spot 1 and 2, that we've um, ended up with probably one of, the, one of the nicest whiskies or two of the nicest whiskies we've done so far. Um, I think that's the basic story, so, Great. so back to you. Peter. So, Nathan, you've been involved right from the start with the remnant releases, the first release being the Scoundrel, a cheeky little 44% number in a 500ml bottle that's almost sold out, almost extinct, I understand it. And then uh, the current release, the fly-by-night in the 700 mil, about 45%, and obviously involved in the latest two releases, the black spots. How do you go to approaching this plethora of barrels you've got from, from that mid-limits distillery to play with? What sort of strategy do you think, oh, I've got to get this type of release out, or you know what you've got from the samples you've tried? It's um, relatively a, a toy box for, for you to play with. Yeah, thanks, Mark. I, I mean, I got involved with Remnant almost kind of day one. Peter called me up and I'd been um, hanging out at Belgo, Belgrove, harassing him for a, a few months, tasting whiskey. And um, and then this project came along and I think I was on the first trip with Peter up to Nantes and we collected, I think, nine barrels in the back of his ute and then another 10 on the trailer and took them back. And I thought, oh, this, this is... This will be it, it'll be fun. We'll come up with some great whiskies from these 19 barrels. We tasted them all literally on the back of the ute, standing in the sun <clears throat> in the tray, sampling, yeah, from these casts that we just picked up. Um, and then didn't hear anything for about a month. And then Peter called me and he said, Oh, we've got some more barrels. And I came back up and there was hundreds there. And um, yeah, a lot of people have been in touch and, and, um, yeah, agree to, to work with these guys or at least you know, have them be a kind of uh, short-term solution while they could figure their way around those excise issues or figure out what they want to do with the casks, which was lovely of these guys to actually offer sort of some short-term accommodation for these casks. Um, but ultimately, I believe most of the 300 casks were purchased by the new Remnant Whiskey Company. So... Yeah, to go about um, blending a whiskey from these casks, I mean, um, we could just take the simple route and dump them all together and release a, a mega blend of 300 casks, and it would be a really good whiskey. Like the, um, it would, um, the highs and lows would probably even out something really nice, but um, there's not much fun in that. So, yeah, I guess initially you taste through every single barrel we have pretty detailed notes on each i mean some casks like peter said are overaged some probably if we were to leave them in the cast that we got them in could need another 10 years to reach a le level of maturity that we think would be good enough to release so we've got this yeah whole range of ages qualities styles so it's pretty pretty complex so first step is just taste everything individually um and then start grouping them into into groups of styles quality flavor profiles um and yeah and then when we're looking to release something it's kind of start to look at what's mature and what's what's the maturity that year um and then it's sort of open we just like almost let the whiskey guide us what do we want to um you know which few casts are really singing out to us all right let's start with them and then we always build a whiskey around a few kind of key casts um but yeah a, a whiskey's built from blending, um, you start looking at quite similar casts together and see how they work together. And then you start to bring in uh, complexity through more diverse elements. Like uh, uh, could be, a, like Peter said earlier, a really woody cask on its own. Um, it's not a great whiskey, but if we can bring in those woody elements to bring like oak and richness to a whiskey, once we've got that kind of core blend, we'll start to feather in and, and look at these other little options. So. It's almost a case by case, and it's partly, yeah, partly driven by what's available and mature at that time. But yeah. Okay. So one thing I noticed about the Remnant Whiskey Co. is you like to have a story behind the names of your bottles and your releases, which is great. Um, when I first heard the Black Spot, it reminded me of the 1983 um, film with Graham Chapman starring his yellow beard, and and they mentioned the Black Spot throughout and the pirate connection there. So it's quite an interesting story that you've come up to focus on the black spot so maybe peter you could tell us a bit why black spot's the name that's been uh, put on these bottles yes well um yeah a lot of the cast or in fact all the casts that came the um the name nant had been um 
covered up with a with a black spot in the spray can. And right in the middle of the barrel, there was their fleur de lis, I think it is, the, the logo. There's a big black spot on there. So all these barrels had a black spot on the end. And, um, yeah, that, that pirate theme of the black spotters. Um, and also, I just found out today, I'd well, forgotten about it too, during the play, the, the play, um, you know, it was any houses that had the plague in it, there was a black spot, I think, put on their door or something like that. And so it, that's a little bit appropriate now for another reason because of the, the virus at the moment. But I don't think anybody's going around putting black spots on people's doors at the moment. But, that, um, yeah, that, that um, yeah, one, one of our investors, uh, Phil, he, he, he comes up with all these names and uh, and name Remnant. We weren't allowed to use that the name Nant. Yeah, so, so I think it might have been Phil that came up again with that, with that name, Remnant. So it's the remnants of this um, barrel investment scheme. Fantastic. So Nathan, can you tell us a little bit about the two black spot releases? What's different between them? What's the same? Yeah, I mean, uh, they're, they're quite different. I think um, the one we're drinking now, the bourbon and sherry, um, I feel like it's, it's distinctly a Tasmanian whiskey, but to me, it's almost, it reminds me a lot of scotch, um, sort of that probably 10 to 12 year old single malt. Um, it's quite light, but full of flavor. There's a lot of, it's quite delicate, but there's a lot going on. It's really quite complex. And it's a whiskey that really evolves from your first sip to your last and being such a, yeah, it's almost, uh, uh, for, yeah, for such a delicate whiskey, there's, there's a lot of complexity there that I really love about it. Um, so it's 50% bourbon, 50% sherry. Um, the bourbon brings that kind of sponge cake, nougat, um, vanilla, all those soft, sweet notes. But bourbon doesn't always bring complexity. So that's where the sherry comes from. The sherry or a pair in this car, in this blend that we were looking to bring in, had to complement the bourbon and couldn't overpower it overpower it so we're looking for some kind of lighter more delicate sherry casks it was actually a handful of dry sherry casks in the mix which i haven't seen a lot of in tasmanian whiskey or almost yeah it's you don't most sherry casks are sweet sherry because it just brings that power and that deliciousness that everyone wants but there was a handful of these lovely dry sherry casks that had um kind of like yeah apple and spice and these really minerally kind of coastal elements so we thought we could bring them in, pair them with the bourbon and have them kind of contrast and dance against each other and um, and have a lot of unique sherry character in there, but without overpowering the bourbon. So I love how in the whiskey, those two kind of profiles are like in complete harmony, but when you're drinking it, you can actually clearly see elements of each um, on, on their own in the whiskey or kind of, yeah, drink it as with them in harmony as one. It's quite a... Yeah, delicate but, but quite a yeah complex and powerful whiskey. And your notes on the second black spot release? Uh, the second black spot release is um, it's kind of like that decadent middle of winter um, after dinner whiskey. I um, lived in the US for a number of years, working in the wine industry over there, and I yeah used to love the kind of holiday season. Um, drinking yeah whiskey with the family over winter and we'd always drink like a big um glendronach or something like that just have these decadent sherry um cask whiskies that are just yet yeah, perfect for a cold winter's night really powerful um and really good to share with people because if you're um, new to whiskey the flavors are, are quite familiar and quite approachable so it's kind of just yeah that decadent winter sharing whiskey just quite rich and powerful and we really the blending of that one was much more simple we're just kind of looking for casts with a similar profile and then there is a bit of work making sure they fit together you can't i mean you can but to make a great whiskey you, you need to bring casts together with care we could have just tipped them all together but we kind of selected you know certain volumes from certain casks um and made sure it all works but it's just the yeah, it's kind of the yeah the richer more crowd pleasing um it's still quite complex um but probably more um yeah it's a lot if you're new to whiskey it's probably the one that you might gravitate a little more towards because it is so easy to drink and quite easy to kind of get your head around so but yeah it's just built built on deliciousness and yeah, probably a bit yeah decadent over the top sherry 
So the two black spot releases, as I understand, are part of a range that will be limited and bought out from, from time to time. The, the first two releases, the Scam from the Fly by Night, they're the type of brand that you're hoping to have available all the time through the whiskey company, the Remnant Whiskey Company. But also you've done a couple of single cast releases. So far it's been in collaboration with uh, the Whiskey List through their Facebook group, Whiskey Lovers. Um, and they were able to name those two releases and cheekily came up with uh, the virus and the vaccine, which was rather apt for towards the end of last year. But I do understand uh, there might be some more single cast releases in the future. Is that something you can tell us a little bit about or give us a bit of a tease? Yes, um, yeah, from what I said earlier, you know, there, there were very few casts there that were really standouts on their own. And, and um, so, yeah, that's why we love this blend. But every now and then we'll, we'll find a really good one. And as they develop over the next few years too, that, that there's some of those fairly ordinary casts at the moment might actually turn into really, really nice ones. So it, it's just something in the future to, to work towards. Um, I'm not sure if Nathan's got any his eye on a, a couple of single casts still or not. <laughs> yeah, there's a few. There's, there's definitely some there that... Um, yeah, potentially a year or two away, but we've yeah, always got our eyes on something. There's yeah, there's a few casts that, that will be quite special. Um, and, but I would say, as, as from my experience in whiskey, like yeah, when you get a really good single cask, it's um, I feel like you almost have to release it because it's it's actually quite rare that you get that harmony and balance and that complexity, and you actually get a perfect finished whiskey within one cask. Uh, most often you have to blend them. So I always like to celebrate those special kind of one, one of a kind casts that, that do have that. So um, yeah, it's, it's hard not to. So as, as much as I'd like to use them in a blend because they they kind of do all your heavy lifting, they actually make the job of blending a whiskey easier. Um, but I, yeah, I feel like it's always a crime to kind of, to let them disappear into a larger blend and um, yeah, they're always so special, but yeah, we'll, we'll definitely try and get them out on their own. But in the near future, I don't, I don't think there's any coming out too soon. But yeah, def definitely long term. For those of you who are unsure about what we mean by blend, it's it's not a, a blending of different distilleries. It's um, you know, blended whiskies by Scottish terms mean you've got several different distilleries supplying barrels to all get blended together, and that's a, a blended whisky like you know, like Johnny Walker. It's a blended whisky. But we're just blending casks from the, the, the single distillery, so it is still a single malt, even though because most most single malt whiskies that come out by volume by a lot like there was would be blenders of different different casks from one distillery. There's very very few single malt whiskies that come out single cask single malt. Now single malt means just one distillery. Single cask single malt means obviously one cask from one distillery, and it's, and it's a malt whisky. But yeah, so when we, when we're blending, we're not um, yeah. We're just trying to get a, a more more bottles of the same flavour and in and, and, and a much, much better balance. And also, um, Nathan's help with this has been fantastic because I'm afraid my taste bud's trying to go through you know, several hundred casts of mostly stuff that's up around this 60% and over. And, um, yeah, my palate gets very tired very quickly. So so what we do, Nathan and I, a bit of a taste through some in the wrap through the bond store from time to time, then he takes samples home and blends them up then when he gets close yeah we, we go down and sit, sit down there for a while and just sit, sip his samples that he's done where he's got to and have a bit more discussion to decide yeah this is this is the one we like so yeah i, I only but really only come in right at the right at the end to yeah for final discussion of what we think we should release right yeah i, I kind of probably do the heavy lifting earlier on but then peter sort of yeah makes the final call i'll present what i like and what i think could work and and Peter usually tastes through, and uh, he's always like, "That's the one." And um, you kind of—I get quite close to it, um, having tasted these whiskies for sometimes a yeah, four, five, six weeks leading up. It's uh, they start to become quite familiar, uh, and it's always great um, to have a pilot like Peter to kind of come in and and see them with with almost he's tasting them at the beginning, but then to taste them at the end with fresh eyes and. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's it's a lot of fun, but those those final kind of um, stages where it becomes quite collaborative again, that's yeah, some of the most enjoyable times. And yeah, getting to taste whiskey with someone like Peter is um, yes, yeah, it's, it's really special. And um, uh, yeah, it's it's one of the best parts of the project. Yeah, people think blending whiskey must be 
the best job in the world, but it, it's, it's, it is hard work. <laughs> <laughs> you really got to keep your mind on it, and um, yeah, a lot of spitting to be done. Yeah, so. I'll, I'll stick with running tasting. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that's the two black spot releases. They're available now online, and I'm sure Fabulous Phil will be getting them to a bar or a bottle shop uh, near you in Tassie soon. Um, we're going to wrap up here. We've got a few people wandering in off the street to have a sample. So if you do happen to be wandering past Salamanca and Jack Green at the moment, pop upstairs for a for a quick dram with us. So. Um, I'll let Fabulous Phil help us there. And, yeah, thank you for joining us. Thanks, Peter. Thanks, Nathan. Thank you, Mark.